last time we left off talking about multiple genes affecting the same trait, and we talked about complementation. I'm not going to go through complementation again, but we're in this theme now of uh, patterns of inheritance that can be explained chromosomally, but are not able to be explained through Mendelian mechanisms, right? So chromosomally, we can talk about why two genes interact. We can do complementation tests, and we can talk about inheritance patterns. It becomes a little bit more complex than just Mendel's simple laws. Uh, today, we're going to keep going with that theme and continue to talk about multiple genes, multiple alleles, and these exceptions to Mendel's laws. So we're into what is called non-Mendelian inheritance, but it's still explainable by chromosomes, right? So it's non-Mendelian. We're going to get to maybe at the end of this lecture, we'll see how far we get. We'll tar start talking about epigenetics, and that is inheritance that isn't explainable by chromosomes. It's going to be extra chromosomal inheritance. But we'll see if we get there. Right now, we're just doing um, chromosomal but non-Mendelian. OK, so the second example I want to talk about is epigenetics. Or, I'm sorry, is uh, epistasis. <laughs> epigenetics is beyond genetics. This is epistasis. Uh, this is like complementation we talked about before. This is going to be two genes that affect the same trait. Okay, But in, or in epistasis, uh, we've got two genes. One of them is the uh, epistatic gene. That is the one that is over or above. It's like the more primary thing. right? Uh, whatever is happening on the, uh, the epistatic gene is going to be the more fundamental characteristic of the trait. Okay? Then there is also what's called a hypostatic gene. And that one is going to be below or under. It's going to be, in a sense, the recessive. It's going to be hidden underneath the genotype of the epistatic. So examples here, I think, are way better than me explaining it. So I'm just going to walk you through this example. So here's a fly, regular fruit fly. It's got nice, well-shaped wings. Okay. The gene, there's a gene that codes for whether or not you have well-shaped or no genes that are no wings at all. So in a single gene, there's a mutation that occurs that when you're homozygous recessive for that gene, you don't make wings at all. Okay. So what you're seeing right here are the little balancers. There's little balancers on this guy too. He's not making any wings at all though. Okay. That is the epistatic gene the gene for whether you're going to make wings or no wings. The hypostatic allele is then dependent upon whether or not you make wings or not. Okay. The hypostatic allele, or a, a hypostatic gene, is the gene that determines whether or not you have a well-formed or, or misshapen uh, vein patterning structure in your wings. Okay. So you can have a normal wild-type vein structure. So you see these characteristic veins that are going through the wings. But there's a mutation in a gene that causes these to be malformed. And so you can see these are disorganized vein structures. You've got kind of good ones here, but up here we've kind of lost all organization of how the wings actually are shaped. Okay. If you are a, a, um, a fly that doesn't make any wings at all, your hypostatic gene is completely hidden. We don't know if you, if you made wings, you might make wings that are normal, or you might make wings that have a bad vein pattern. But if the epistatic gene is recessive and you're not making any wings at all, the other phenotype is hidden, right? We don't know what you are. So if this guy comes out, would he have made good wings or bad wings? If he had made wings, we don't know. So it is the hypostatic or the hidden trait, OK? Another example, this is, uh, this is recessive epistasis. So the recessive allele of the epistatic gene, when it's recessive, it's going to hide the other one. Okay, So that's recessive epistasis. If you're recessive, you hide the other. Uh, there also is dominant, and we'll go through that in a second. But here's a, a second example of, uh, of epistasis, of recessive epistasis. Uh, this is coat color in Labrador dogs. So there's two genes, and now we'll actually give you some, some genotypes. A black Labrador is dominant for this E gene. The gene that we're calling E determines whether or not a lab makes pigment or doesn't make pigment. 
Okay? So if it's got a dominant allele of the E gene, it is going to be making pigment. That is the, uh, the epistatic gene. The hypostatic gene determines what color do you make if you make color. Okay? So this is a dominant E. It's going to make pigment. And in a black lab, you've got a dominant B allele for this B gene. This is what actual pigment color you make. So the dominance in that hypostatic is, is to make black color. So you can, you can either be a homozygous dominant and make black, or you could be a heterozygous, dom, or heterozygous, a big B and a small B, and you would still make black. Now, if you are little b, little b for that pigment color, you're going to code for brown. Okay? So to, to show any pigment at all, you're going to have to have the big E allele. If you are making pigment, but you're homozygous recessive for the B gene, you're going to make brown. If you are homozygous recessive for the E gene, this is recessive epistasis. So the recessive is now going to hide what the genotype is of the other, right? Because now it doesn't matter what you are coding for for the B gene. You could be homozygous dominant. You could be big B, big B. But it absolutely does not matter, because since you're recessive for the E gene, you're not making any pigment at all. So you're a yellow lab. No pigment. So this is recessive because the recessive epistatic gene is hiding the hypostatic. Yeah. What this does to your ratios in a recessive ap uh, epistasis is this is the genotypes now for, for those Labradors, right? Uh, if I have a good copy, wild type copy, dominant copy of the E gene, then I'm either going to be black or brown, depending on what the genotype of the B gene is, right? So if, if I did a dihybrid cross, then I would get 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 genotypes here, right? So if I took a heterozygote at each gene, crossed it to another individual that has heterozygous at each gene, and I would get the characteristic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. This is just a dihybrid cross, right? So these are the possible genotypes I have. But what's going to happen is you're not going to show one of these phenotypes. It's going to be mixed in with the other because it's going to be hidden. So. Big E could either be black, homozygous dominant, or heterozygous. So that's the most common. That's going to be nine individuals in this expected uh, phenotype ratio in this next generation. Three of them are going to be small b with one copy of the big E gene. That's going to be brown. But any time you have homozygous recessive in the E gene, you're going to be yellow. So it's going to blend those two genotypes, and they're going to show the exact same phenotype. Right? So this, the three instances of this genotype and the one instance of that genotype are going to look the same. They're both going to be yellow. So it basically sandwiches those two into one, uh, one ratio. Right? So instead of being 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, you're going to be 9 to 3 to 4. So if you ever see phenotypic ratio that's 9 to 3 to 4, you know recessive epistasis is going on. And all you have to determine is which is the hypostatic allele and which is the other. That's easy to figure out because the most common one is going to tell you what the, uh, what the hypostatic allele was it was for coat color. Does that make sense, how, the, how those two are going to fuse? OK. There's also dominant epistasis. And that is when you have the dominant allele means that you hide the hypostatic trait. Okay. This is the case in squash. Um, coat color and pigmentation color is really common when we're talking about these phenotypic ratios. It's just it's a really easy thing to identify. So a lot of these examples are for color. Um, here, you're going to have, uh, well, well, we'll think about a dihybrid cross. OK, two genes, if you took two individuals that were heterozygous for both of them and crossed them. 
we get these possible genotypes. So we're talking about a W gene and a Y gene. Each of them can be uh, dominant and recessive alleles, OK? So here's my 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Here, the color is being hidden, but it's being hidden by having a dominant allele of the, of the W gene, OK? So if you have a dominant allele of W, you're going to be white. And it doesn't matter whether you've got the genotype to be yellow or green. White is going to dominate and is going to hide the other trait. Right? So in the Labradors, you know, being yellow or being lacking pigment, was you had to be recessive for the E. Here, being dominant for the W means you turn white. So in the 9, this is going to be white. In the 3 with the dominant W, you're going to also be white. So you're going to see the 9 and the 3 merge together. And so instead of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, you're going to get 12 to 3 to 1. If you see 12 to 3 to 1, you know you're talking about dominant epistasis. Now, if you're recessive for the W, that means you actually get to show the other genotype. And so then, depending on what you are here, yellow is the dominant trait here. So if you're a dominant Y, you'll be yellow. If you're a recessive Y, then you show the green phenotype. OK, so this is dominant versus recessive epistasis. Questions on this? There's, there's a couple of questions in your homework from last time and from this time now that will work, work your brains on figuring this out. OK. That's two genes working on each other. Now I want to talk about multiple alleles. Because up until this point, we've been just describing genes as either having a dominant or a recessive um, allele. And that works great for Mendel's work, and it works great for most traits that just have two, two alleles, either a functioning or a non-functioning allele, basically. But there can be multiple alleles that have varying phenotypes associated with them. And so again, an example here is coat color in rabbits. Coat color in rabbits has actually got multiple alleles associated with a single gene. Okay? So we're not talking about epistasis anymore. That would be two genes. We're just talking about one gene, but multiple alleles. So there is a big C allele. A big C allele gives you a very dark gray, almost black phenotype. Okay? And that is the most dominant of the alleles. So instead of just being able to say dominant or recessive, we're now going to have a continuum here where some alleles are dominant over others, but not, but not over the others. Okay, so big C is dominant over every other allele. If you've got a big C and anything else, you're going to be a very dark, almost black pigment. Okay. Now, you've got other now recessive alleles, and they're kind of all recessive to C, to big C, but they're then dominant or recessive to each other. So the next allele is called the chinchilla allele. Um, this is a rabbit. It's just a light gray color. It's just called chinchilla color in the rabbit. So I guess it's because chinchillas are often this color. Uh, the chinchilla allele, if you're um, homozygous for the chinchilla, then you're just a light gray. Okay. Now, there's another allele, and this one we have to talk about a little bit. It's this one called CH. This is a heat-sensitive allele. And you got this in your last homework set. There was a fly heat-sensitive allele. What this is, it's a mutation in the gene that makes the, the protein uh, susceptible to unfolding. Okay? So it's a functional gene if you keep it at low temperatures, and it functions just like the wild-type allele. But if you bring it up to higher temperatures, the protein doesn't, can't hold its structure. It basically becomes denatured and non-functional. And it acts then at high temperatures like it's a recessive allele. And it won't do its function. So if you are, um, let's talk about this guy, C sub, uh, superscript H, C superscript H. Okay, This is the temperature sensitive mutant. If you're homozygous for that, then in areas of low temperature in the animal, the gene will work fine. So extremities, 
the feet, the ears, the tip of the nose are cooler areas because there's not quite as much blood circulation. They're thin, they're not close to the, uh, you know, the heat producing kidneys and the rest of the body. And so those areas are cool enough to allow the protein to fold properly and function normally. And so those areas show the very, very dark, like it's a big C allele, functional wild type protein. But in areas of high temperature, most of the body, the body temperature itself is too high for the protein to function normally. And so it stops working, and so you don't make any pigment at all. So you get this characteristic white body and dark colored extremities. Okay. Now, the chinchilla, if you've got a heterozygous for this chinchilla, then the whole body is only going to show the chinchilla phenotype. Right, because this heat temperature one is, is going to be non-functional. But in the extremities, the, the heat functional one will be functioning. <laughs> the heat sensitive one will be functioning. And so it will be dominant over the chinchilla. So you'll have dominant dark extremities. But where the heat, temp heat sensitive one isn't, uh, isn't working, then the chinchilla will be dominant over that. And then there is an actual non-functional, completely non-functional, no matter what temperature you're at, small C allele. And so that one, if you're homozygous recessive for that one, you don't make any pigment at all, not even in your extremities, and you're completely white. Um, this is actually a fairly simple, <laughs> even though it's, this is, a, this is complicated, right? Because it depends on what temperature and what allele you have. Um, but there's multiple alleles for almost every human trait. Right? We're only talking about four alleles here for rabbit coat color. But if you start thinking about eye color or your pigmentation or any type of other phenotypes that you're thinking about in the human, there's multiple alleles going on, maybe even dozens of alleles. Uh, so human genetics gets even more complicated than this. Um, if you start thinking about a trait that maybe has two or three genes that affect that trait, and each one of those two or three genes has half a dozen or a dozen alleles, you can get the idea of how hard it is now to, to anticipate and predict what uh, human offspring ratios are. The other thing that makes human genetics difficult is you can't selectively pair up people and tell them to breed, right, <laughs> to do the experiment. You just, have to, you just have to analyze what has happened. And humans only usually have, you know, in really extreme examples, maybe a dozen or more offspring, but that's, that's unlikely, right, usually two or three. Uh, depending on what culture you're in. So to try and figure out the ratios and, and the predictings, uh, it gets really hard to do. So this is multiple alleles. The next um, phenomena that doesn't match to Mendel's laws is this idea of incomplete dominance. So this is where a heterozygote looks different than a homozygous dominant. In Mendel's laws, if you have the dominant allele, then you dominate over whatever the other one is. So it doesn't matter if you're homozygous dominant or if you're a heterozygote, you look the same. Right? Having a big allele, having a wild type allele uh, dictates your phenotype. In incomplete dominance, the heterozygote shows a phenotype. And a good example is snapdragons. Here is two pure breeding strains. One's Completely red snapdragon. Here's completely white. The red is the dominant trait, so homozygous dominant for R. This, the white is homozygous recessive. And in Mendel's predictions, if you had a heterozygote, it should just be red because you've got the dominant allele. But what actually takes place in snapdragons is if you cross these two individuals, all of the offspring in the first generation show a pink phenotype. It's not red, it's not white, it's an intermediate. It's a distinct phenotype that the heterozygote has that's different from either the homozygous dominant or the homozygous recessive. Okay. Um, this is usually like a percentage game. What's happening in the Snapdragon is you're making the, the functional R protein that gives you the dark red pigment. But in any one cell, you've only got one good copy of it. And it's a fairly slow-working enzyme. And so it just doesn't produce as much dark red pigment. 
right? So if, you're, if you've got two good copies of the, the enzyme, you make a lot of red pigmentation. If you only have one copy of the enzyme, you make a little bit of it, so you're only slightly red. You're kind of a pink, right? So then you're going to get all of these heterozygotes that look the same. When you do in the F2 generation, you cross two of these. Again, you're going to have one quarter of them having the dark red, because they're homozygous dominant, one quarter of them being white, because they're homozygous recessive, and then two of them showing the pink phenotype. The heterozygote shows a phenotype. So then you see this weird 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So incomplete dominance when the heterozygote shows a phenotype. The next one is codominance. Codominance is when you have two alleles. We're still talking about the same gene, just a single gene. Two alleles both show dominance. That is, one is not dominant over the other. They both show up just as robustly as the other. So a good example of this is blood type. Human blood type, there's actually multiple, well, Blood type is determined by what are the proteins that you put on the outside of your red blood cells. Okay? Just like every cell in your body, red blood cells put certain proteins out on the membrane that distinguish it as a certain type of cell. And your body is very attuned to these proteins that are put on the outside of your cells, because if some invading cell comes in, you want to be able to recognize that as an invading cell. So your immune system is developed so that you make antibodies against any protein except the ones that you specifically make. So if we transplant organs and I get a tissue type from somebody else, my body will recognize that by the cell surface proteins. We'll say that's not the kind of proteins I put on my cells, and we'll start attacking it. Um, one of these types is, uh, is the A or B protein that gets put on the outside of the cells. There's actually something like 30 different proteins that your red blood cells actually put on the outside of them. So we usually talk about AB as your, as your blood type, and AB positive or AB negative, that's a different factor. You either put this RH factor or you don't. So there's two of the really common blood typings. But there's actually, like I think, something like 30 other genes that are expressed that are proteins that you could put on the outside of your red blood cells. So um, when you're doing typing, especially for blood transfusions, most of the time, if you're doing a blood transfusion, getting the AB type and the, plus posit the RH type, plus or minus, uh, positive or negative, if you get those two right and you match, then you probably won't have rejection of red blood cells. But there are some individuals that you have to do further typing, and you have to look at multiple other types of proteins that you put on. Um, so this is just the surface of cell-cell of recognition. But the AB protein that gets put out there is codominant. So this gene, we're going to refer to the gene as I. So the I gene can have three alleles. It can either have the IA allele. That codes for the A-type protein that you put on the cells. It can be I superscript B. That codes for the B-type protein that you put out there. Or you could be small i, and that is you don't put any protein. There's not a functional protein. So we call that O, or lacking the protein. Okay, so the genotype for these, if you're, uh, if you're homozygous for the A type, then you're going to make A type blood. You're going to put that protein on the outside of your cells. Okay, if you're AO, you're still going to put the A type out there, right? This is just traditional classic dominant recessive, okay? Same with B. You either put B out there as a homozygous dominant, or you can put P, B out there as the heterozygote. But if you have A and B alleles, that means you put both types of protein on the outside of your cells. So they are codominant. One is not dominant over the other. They are codominant. They both show the same. You, sh you show the, the phenotype at the exact same time. Okay? Then if you have just two copies of the recessive, you don't put any protein out there. So 
a person who has O-type blood can give blood to anybody because they don't have any of those proteins out there. And so if you're AB and someone gives you their O blood, well, you don't recognize any foreign things at all, right? You don't see any proteins on the outside of their cell, so they don't attack them. Um, now, this gets more complicated when you start adding the other factors in, right? Because if you're, so O negative means you're not putting anything out on your red blood cells. And so that can, you can donate that kind of blood to anybody. If you're O positive, well, that means you are putting the RH factor out there. So anybody who's, who's negative is going to recognize that as a foreign particle. So to type, you have to be specific on all these points. But I just want you to get the idea of codominance, that both proteins are being expressed at the same time. Okay. Rachel, do you have a question? And that's talking about the antibodies that the person who has that type of blood makes. Okay. So if you are O, that means your red blood cells don't have any proteins on the outside of them. And so if you get any type of blood that has proteins on the outside, your antibodies that you make will attack it. Right? So if you have O blood, you can only take O blood. You can't take it from anybody else. But when you give it, you give vanishingly few of your own antibodies in a transfusion. I mean, what you're giving is the, is the blood cells. So whoever's getting the blood, we think about what are the antibodies that they're making, OK? So they're making antibodies against A or against B. But if you give them O, then they don't rec the antibodies don't recognize that as foreign. So you can, they can receive it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you just basically say, well, the antibodies are not really coming through in the sera, so in, their, in the actual blood. Yeah? Can you explain codominant? What I mean by codominant is that in this genotype, both of the dominant traits are being expressed. The trait that's being expressed is what protein type do you put on your cell? That's codominant because they're putting both the A and the B type protein. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so a person with AB blood will recognize both A and both B as being normal proteins. So they could receive A blood from somebody because they, they wouldn't recognize that as foreign. So, oh, yeah, I got A. That's fine blood. They would also accept B blood because they recognize that as normal. And they wouldn't care if they got O blood because that's not expressing any of the proteins. So, yeah, AB is the universal acceptor. O is the universal donor. Lethal alleles. If a certain genotype kills you, then you're not going to show that phenotype in the offspring. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, right? So. Here is a, uh, well, it could be either dominant or recessive. Uh, if the trait is lethal, so in this case, the AY, I don't even know what this, this gene is. It's just an example. But if you're AY, AY, if you're homozygous for that, you're going to die in development. So in this case, uh, it's mice. That mice, that mouse, that that genotype would never make it through, uh, through the process of embryology. Would never get, uh, would never be born, and so you'd die. So whatever the genotype of that would be, you don't know because it doesn't show up. Right, the phenotype is dead. Now, if there's a way to look in in development, you might be able to see this. But most of the time, when we're talking about phenotypic ratios, we're talking about live-born offspring. And so this will throw your ratios off a little bit. Instead of being you know, a 3 to 1, so this Y allele codes for, I guess, yellow coat color. So you've got yellow coat color. And this genotypically, if we're just thinking about coat color, should be a yellow. And so you should see in the offspring three individuals having yellow coat color and only one of them having dark. But if the homozygous guy dies, then instead of seeing 3 to 1, you're going to see 2 to 1. 
This would happen if this guy was the, if a homozygous uh, for this one, if that one died and this one survived, then you would see three to nothing, right? Three yellows, and you wouldn't see the brown phenotype. So this can either work in the dominant or the recessive, um, but most of the time it's going to be recessive, and so instead of seeing, uh, I'm sorry, a homozygous dominant, so instead of seeing a three to one ratio, you would see a two to one ratio instead if the homozygous dominant genotype killed you. Uh, if, if a gene is lethal, if you, have, if you have the potential of having lethal alleles in a gene, we would say that that's an essential gene, right? You can't live without it. To heap more confusion upon confusion, <laughs> uh, there is this issue called penetrance. Penetrance is the frequency that an individual shows the phenotype that you expect him to show based on his genotype. Okay, so genotypically, in this example, all of these individuals are homozygous dominant. Okay, we'll say brown, uh, brown coat color for brown puffballs. I don't know what this animal is. Some coat color, right? So genotypically, if you're big B, big B, you expect them to be 100% brown, right? That's what it, you expect the genotype to be. So if you actually saw that, this is what we've typically been saying, we've been showing you all examples of complete penetrance, 100% penetrance. They all show the phenotype that you expect. But some genes don't do that. And it could be for epistasis reasons. It could be for multiple allele reasons. Basically, it's any reason that you don't know. If you see variance in that penetrance. So here, all of these individuals are also genotypically, if you sequence them all, they all have two good copies of the B gene. They're all big B, big B. But some of them are not producing pigment for unknown reasons. So we would say that this is only 80% penetrant. The phenotype of dark bodied is only 80% phenotype, because only eight out of 10 of these is actually showing the phenotype that you expect. The others are showing what looks like a recessive phenotype. But actually, genotypically, if you sequence them, they are homozygous dominant. So there could be a whole variety of reasons why this is true, and so maybe an incomplete dominance example could actually be explained by epistasis. But if you don't know what that other gene is and you don't know how it's being inherited, you basically just have to say, well, there's some other extenuating factor that's making it not penetrate. So you'd say that this is 80% penetrance. Does that make sense? So you can have multiple genes each of them having multiple alleles, each of them being incompletely dominant or co-dominant, or not penetrating completely. Or they could have a variable expressivity. <laughs> so here, this is the degree to which a penetrant gene is expressed. In penetrance, I said it either penetrated or it didn't. It was like yes or no. Expressivity is like the range of phenotypes that a certain genotype can give. So again, this would be 100% penetrant and 100% or constant expressivity. Okay? They all show what you expect it to and all are robustly as dark as everybody else. In a variable expressivity, the phenotype is penetrating. You've got some pigment going on here in these brown individuals, but you could have dark brown, light brown, yellow. This is a range of expressivity. All of these individuals have the exact, exact identical genotype. They are all big B, big B. But if big B, big B gives you a range of pigments, we call that expressivity, okay? So this is not Incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance would be we know that they're heterozygotes, and that's why they're showing lighter. These are all homozygous dominance. 
but the homostigus dominant kind of gives you a range of phenotypes. Doesn't always give you dark brown like you'd like it to. So this expressivity, you could, um, well, I'll answer Rachel's question and then I'll go, yeah. So you're talking about like editing or something like that? Yeah, I guess this could be explained by editing if, if certain ones turn it off. Um, it could also be explained by temperature variant mutants as well, right? If you've got a certain allele that it was, is, you know, for whatever reason these guys were, you know, kept at lower temperatures or something and so they don't make as robust a phenotype. Um, it could be just expression levels. You know, you have the same genotype but maybe one individual doesn't make as many copies of the protein as another one does. And so you get a lighter phenotype because you don't have as many active enzymes there. So and there's a lot of ways we could explain this, but I'm just saying if you don't know what the explanation is, we would just say it's got variable expressivity. Okay? So pigmentation is showing up, but whether it's dark or light, that's variable. So if you think about that, you could also have this could be incomplete penetrance, right? Because these guys are white. They're not making any pigments at all. So we would say that this gene is 2, 4, 6, 8, 80% 80 penetrant with variable expressivity, right? Because pigmentation is showing up 80% of the time, but what color the pigmentation is varies. But these would all have the exact same genotype, right? Um, issues like this come up, um, and a lot of these are environmental factors that are influencing it. So one of the things could be the age, right? Uh, humans' hair color starts changing over time. Um, my hair color was pretty light brown, even blondish when I was a kid. It turned dark. It's now starting to s slowly turn white, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, that expressivity is changing over the age of me, right? So the age of your organism might, might play into this. Um, the sex as well, you know, certain, certain organisms, depending on male or female, will change their expression levels. We'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about X inactivation, because male and female, if they've got different uh, number of sex chromosomes, might affect that. Also the temperature, we've seen those temperature uh, sensitive uh, nutrition levels, you know, sometimes you won't show a phenotype unless you're uh, malnourished. Or sometimes you won't show a phenotype unless you have a really high level of something in your diet. So environmental and various other environmental things could happen. And stress can also be a factor too. You can stress organisms and they might do different things. Um, if you stress humans, uh, they can do different things as well. So. Multiple genes, multiple alleles, penetrance, expressivity, make human genetics really hard. Okay, so that's what I'm calling non-Mendelian. Now I'm going to move into um, epigenetic and non-chromosomal mutations, or I guess I shouldn't say non-chromosomal mutations. Traits that are uh, coded for outside of the realm of just what your gene sequence is on your chromosome, okay? So I guess extra chromosomal or epigenetic. So epigenetics is the, the study of changes in phenotype for reasons other than changes in the nucleotide sequence, okay? So you could have identical organisms, you know, identical twin organisms and you can get different traits out of them, even though they've got the exact same nucleotide sequence, there are additional things that determine what trait that organism shows, okay? One of these is organelles, cytoplasm, cell biology things. How does the cell use the genotype that it has? Number two is the state of the DNA. Just because a cell has two alleles of every gene doesn't mean they always make both alleles, right? 
because you can actually shut down one of the chromosomes. You could compact the chromosome down, and you could only show one allele. You could only express one allele. So the state of the chromatin level in a cell is going to be, will affect the, the outcome, the genotype. Uh, I'm sorry, will affect the phenotype. You'd have the exact same genotype, but if one cell shut down one chromosome and another shell, cell shut down the other chromosome, you could have varying different expressions of genes but just because you are selectively expressing one allele or the other, okay? And then third, we've already talked about this a little bit too, is RNA editing. Just because your genome, just because the DNA codes for a certain sequence, the cell can sometimes change that sequence when it comes around to expressing the mRNA and making the protein. So all three of these are, uh, they're outside the nucleotide sequence, right? Doesn't matter what the nucleotide sequence is, the cell can basically decide how to express. Also, there's extra nuclear inheritance. So typically, when we talk about um, genotypic ratios, we're talking about uh, the nuclear genome, the chromosomes that are in the nucleus of all the cells. But you have to remember that in plants, plants have chloroplasts, and chloroplasts also have DNA. They've got their own genome. So the inheritance of the chloroplasts will affect your genotype. And then mitochondria as well. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts replicate independently, and they are inherited maternally. When a female is making an egg, that egg contains lots and lots of copies of mitochondria. When the sperm fertilizes an egg, it's virtually zero contribution from the male. Males, the sperm uh, hardly ever actually gives a mitochondria to the fertilized um, embryo, the zygote, the developing organism. So all of the mitochondria in your body is the type of mitochondria that your mother gave you in the egg. Uh, there's been only very rare occurrences where people have actually had uh, father's mitochondria in their cells. So virtually 100% of the time, the mitochondria you inherited came from your mom, and so whatever genes that your father had on the mitochondria are not going to affect your phenotype. You don't get them. So same with plants and chloroplasts. Uh, the female contribution is going to be the one that gives the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, since plants have both. Now, there are some human conditions that are coded for by genes on the mitochondria. Um, there's not a lot of them, but aging diseases, there's certain, um, certain diseases that show up as you age, uh, can be affected by mitochondrial proteins that you have. Uh, usually metabolic things are what goes on. Um, on the mitochondrial genome, They've got a circular genome. It only codes for 13 proteins in humans. Um, there is DNA polymerase to duplicate the mitochondrial genome, so it makes its own polymerase. There's an RNA polymerase, so the mitochondria uses its own uh, RNA polymerase to make its mRNAs. And then there's the other, uh, the other 11 proteins are all involved in metabolism, in breaking down um, in the Krebs cycle, the electron transport cycle, uh, those are all coded, uh, m most of those are coded for by the, the mitochondrial genome. So there's some metabolic disorders and some aging disorders that are actually inherited maternally based on, you know, if you've got mutant alleles of the proteins that came with the mitochondria. So these are, this is two examples of extra nuclear inheritance. There's also the centrioles. The centrioles are non-nuclear inheritance, right? It's not chromosomes. These are just uh, microtubules organizations. But the mother and the father both contribute a set of centrioles. And so there are certain cell division events, things that happen at fertilization, that are affected by the centrioles that you inherit. So, so these cell biology things can actually be inherited, right? but it's not on the genome. We may, we may get to these later, but for now, I just want you to think 
mitochondria, chloroplasts, and centrioles. All right, I want to switch. Well, actually, I'm not going to start this. Three minutes is not enough to get into this. Uh, next time, we'll, we'll start talking about true epigenetic factors, uh, ways that you can suppress or express certain genotypes um, based on how the cell condenses the DNA, so whether or not the DNA is active or inactive. So we'll talk about genomic imprinting, that is uh, how male or females actually specifically shut down certain regions of the genome. And so it doesn't change the nucleotide sequence, but it'll change, it'll change what alleles you get to express. So we'll talk about epigenetics next time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.